This Anglo-Indian story is with Zelma Phillips in Melbourne, Australia. She was born in Varanasi, India in 1951, then emigrated to Australia with her family in 1972. Zelma is a self-published author. Her first book, The Anglo-Indian Australian Story, My Experience, is a collection of Anglo-Indian migration heritage stories, first released in 2004, and provides the reader with a unique and personal insight into the diaspora from India that transformed the Anglo-Indian community. Hi Zelma, and thank you for being our first interviewee in our Anglo-Indian story series. Thanks Lynn for giving me the opportunity to be here. Zelma, can you start by telling us a little bit about your life and family in India? I was brought up in a large family, um, six sisters and one brother. And uh, I lived in Lucknow, or the vicinity of Lucknow, that's where my family comes from. And um, my dad had left the railways when I was growing up, so um, the parents found it a bit difficult. And mum uh, managed to send us to boarding school where she got us a scholarship. And that was the best part of my childhood, being in boarding school with friends and my sisters. And we had a great time over there. And I learned a lot from being in boarding school and building friendships. Do you keep in touch with your friends from school? I keep in touch with a lot of friends. I send them emails, I visit them when I go on holidays, I stay in their homes, and we see them at dinner parties, at dances. Um, yes, yeah, so I do keep in touch. So it's like a big extended family more than... Family. Yeah, we are like sisters. The bond is very close with uh, boarding school buddies. And do you go yes. to the reunions? I go to a re the reunions often, and we had one on Easter Monday this year. And we had uh, about eight of us got together over lunch. We had a great time. We had lunch. We told stories about the nuns, or the jokes we used to play, and all the tricks. Uh, we spoke about different girls in school and uh, wondered, I wonder what she's doing, I wonder who she's married to. <laughs> it sounds like fun. Yeah, we, we had great, a great time. Yeah. Zoma, you've written a book. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about it, uh, what it was like to research and plan to gather the stories and to just go out and find and meet the people. What was it like? How was it for you? Um, the book, yeah, it was great fun, uh, just thinking up the concept of the book. I had no idea what I was doing. I just wanted to capture stories before uh, people passed on because they had so much history um, with them. And um, this is the book that I ended up with. And uh, I knew a lot of people who wanted to tell me their stories. So basically, uh, that's where I started. Uh, I sort of knew about a lot about Anglo-Indians being one myself. And I just wanted to capture their childhood and their experience of migration to Australia. That's a brilliant idea, but a huge job. I have to say, what made you started in the first place and more importantly what made you take it through to finish it? It's so big. What motivated you? And the main thing about the book was uh, capturing the stories really. I didn't want to lose um, the history part of it. Uh, we were a special community. We um, sort of lived in a special time in India when India got its independence. Yeah. And I didn't want to lose all that part of it. And no one had been through what we had been, like deciding to leave our country. That must have been hard. Why did you leave? Uh, the, most of the reasons why people left and why we left were because we were afraid of what India was going to turn out to be for our community. We were afraid of the future. It was very uncertain. And uh, then uh, most of our parents also wanted a better economic future for us. And that was the main reason, I think, why many of us left India and filled out those forms. It seems to be, you know, judging from your book, uh, the thing that motivated those people too, you know, to leave was uncertainty, I guess, in India. Yeah, I think we were worried about would we be able to speak English, would we be able to send our kids to Catholic schools, 
uh, the majority we were a minority being Christian yeah. and uh, it was a lot of uncer uncertainty in those days well did I have to ask this because going through that project and you're hearing other people's stories all the time and it must make you reflect on your own being an Anglo-Indian, did it change your perspective on what it means to be an Anglo-Indian? I must admit at the time in India growing up we uh, didn't uh, focus on our culture that much. We were a minority in India and we were excited about coming to Australia and we were quite excited about leaving India and like going out into the wide world and I was about 20 at the time. So I must admit that I uh, worried about the Anglo-Indian culture much later on and not at the time when I was actually leaving. When I was young and when exciting I was, yeah, thing to It do. was mostly about like going to dances and uh, meeting up with friends and things that you know we focused on the still social being, life. Yeah, yeah, so still an Anglo-Indian community. Well, the Anglo-Indians, of course, had this huge diaspora. They've all moved out into the world. Do you think it's affected the community? How has it affected it? I think moving out into the big wide world has definitely changed our perspective on what it means to be an Anglo-Indian. Um, first of all, like we're exposed to different cultures. Yeah. We were always multicultural, living with Muslims and Hindus. But this is now the big wide world and we become more open in uh, like just the way we view other cultures and other people. And um, we realize, also realized we had something special back there in India. And we grew up in a very special kind of culture. It was very, um, w wasn't closed, but it was very protected. protected we were yes. very protected in very strict upbringing. And uh, now coming to Australia, this was the big wide world. And we were exposed to so many different kind of cultures and also the media, TV. And we didn't have that when we were growing up. So it was lots to explore and a lot of fun, like to be given the opportunity to migrate and to come to Australia. So do you consider yourself an Australian now or an Anglo-Indian first? Which one? Yeah, I must say now I feel very Australian because I've been here now the rest of my life, which is about like 25 years in Australia. No, I've actually been here 30 something years, 32 years and um, 20 years in India. So I have that heritage and I'll never forget it and I have fond mem memories of growing up in India but I think I feel Australian. My kids are married Australians and uh, a Sri Lankan and uh, we definitely live in an Australian environment at home and although we eat Indian food and we might have the occasional Anglo-Indian dance uh, a lot of our friends are Anglo-Indian as well, but definitely I would say I've integrated in so barbecues and oh, beaches. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't the say the beach as yeah, much, yeah. but yeah. definitely barbecues and uh, yeah, I fit. I feel like I fit into the Australian way of life. Where was it like that when you first came here? Did you have any problems or was... when I first came, it was quite different because I myself felt different. And um, in the workplace, because of this feeling, I felt I didn't integrate as much, although like the intention was there and we spoke the language, that was a big, big bonus. And uh, I could go out to socials with the girls at work, but uh, there was something that like, uh, I felt I didn't fully belong when I first arrived. I think it took me about maybe five years to actually feel part of the new yes, community. it must have been really, really hard. I mean, a whole new lifestyle to begin with. I mean, Australians are pretty laid yeah. back. Uh, it was very, the, the Australians weren't the problem. I think the problem was lied with, uh, lay with myself, really, because um, we just had a different upbringing. We went to boarding school. We had a very close-knit community and uh, yeah, that was just uh, coming out of our, our shell, in a sense. But the Australians were no problems. 
uh, I for one didn't uh, encounter a lot of racism. Some of our friends did. And, uh, but it's part of the learning experience, mm -hmm. and you put it down to that. There were very few like brown-skinned people when we came to Australia, in Melbourne. No, predominantly so, white European. That's right, yeah. so we did, we were different. But um, I must say, you know, people accepted us, and they were very friendly, and I didn't sort of feel that I was not well, being welcomed. I've got an Anglo-Indian friend who calls Anglo-Indians beautiful hybrids. See, so you just came and planted Plant, yourself yeah, on Australian right. shores. <laughs> Zelma, you're writing another book. The first must have been a positive experience that you got through and produced it. I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful book. And you produce this. Was it difficult for you to write it? Uh, the first book, yeah, was difficult because I didn't know where to start. I had the concept and uh, I had never produced a book before. But I just took it in my stride and I had a deadline because we were... Deadlines are a good idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were also producing a um, project for the Australian Immigration Museum. Oh, that was the, the one that was on yeah, with the East Indian Club. Club with yeah. Richard Johnson and Keith Butler and Marion D'Souza and I think it was Glenn De Cruz. And I set myself that deadline in December 2004, and I just, like, you know, uh, broke my book up into goals yes. and into pieces, and I just did one story at a time. And uh, in the end, I had this book, which you can see now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, I think it's wonderful. I've, yeah. I've read quite a bit of it now. So how's your new book progressing? The new book, I must admit, is a bit slow because I have other business priorities as well. But I, at the moment, I'm interviewing a girl, a friend of mine, who is um, has got cancer. And uh, she tells me a lot about her life in India. And she's got a very, very interesting life. So I'm trying to capture as much as I can. Oh, that's uh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Her, We're yeah. looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, what did people think when you told them you were first bringing out, you, you were doing your first book? Did you tell them in the beginning that you were writing a book? I think I might have told friends and family, but I don't think they realized that I would actually go ahead and complete the book because it was just an idea in my head. I myself didn't know how I was going to end up with it. But I think I just do one step at a time, set the deadlines, and I got help from Harry McClure, who oh, yeah. published the book in the end. And uh, this was done in Madras in India. Sure. Well, Selma, getting back to your book, I keep going back to this, I'm sorry. <laughs> but getting back to your book, um, how did you fund it? How did you fund its publication? Yeah. Uh, at the time I was uh, in full-time employment and I was able to fund it myself and uh, I think I spent about $3,000 all told on the publishing oh. and the freight was horrendous from India. Oh, but that must have been. Did, did it come by surface or did you actually uh, fly it? I no, it was, I think, cost. by sea mail. Harry McClear organised it by sea mail but, yeah, the freight took a lot out oh, of the book, so I can imagine I think most of it went on that. So what's the second book about? The second book, I wanted it to be mostly about Anglo-Indians in Australia, but I must admit that people, um, Anglo-Indians, they want to take me back to their childhoods in India and talk about their childhoods. And even though we've had rehashed this concept over and over again by many Anglo-Indian authors, it's what people want to relate. And yeah, I think everybody has a book in them. They say, well, right. they've all got their stories, and it doesn't matter if it's been yeah. done before. They still want to want do the to. same thing. So I think I will still focus on their childhoods. Selma, you've, um, you mentioned that your, part of your, your motivation for doing the book was to record Anglo-Indian stories before it was too late, before they became lost. So um, why do you think it's important for the community to record its oral and photographic history like this? Why, why do you believe that? I feel that the community is um, passing on, like there's a lot of people in their 70s, 80s, and they've lived through the time of independence. Uh, they've lived through the British Raj, they've lived through immigration to Australia, and I've, oh gosh, 
I just feel that they, they know so much about um, that part of history and um, it was a unique period in, in the history of the world that time in India when India went through this ter turbulent times and I feel someone needs to capture them, the stories of individuals, not what people portray Anglo-Indians to be, but what people themselves have experienced. Yeah, rather than how some historians That's right. to get yeah. it straight from the horse's mouth. Because there's some movies like um, Cotton Mary, oh, Gawani Jun <laughs> Junction, and they portray Anglo-Indians in a not so good light. Yes. And I feel that if I ask people their own stories, they'd be able to tell us from the horse's mouth as oh. well, how they experience their lives. And also, we didn't experience that part of Anglo-India portrayed by journalists. We didn't experience that um, kind of life. So I'm sure there was a seedy part to Anglo-Indian life and there was a good side. I just want to tell it like it is. Yeah, just the yeah. ordinary people ordinary telling, people. telling their yeah. stories. I think it's brilliant, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Zelma, so, there's been a big um, rise of interest in the Anglo-Indian community. Um, do you have any idea why this has happened? I mean, academics are looking at it now. And as you say, filmmakers, like I think it was Merchant Ivory did Cotton Mary, Cotton which Mary, people yeah. call Rotten Mary when they speak <laughs> the yeah. dreadful story. But any idea why there's this renewed interest mm. in the community? I think there's lots of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that India ha is now 60 years past or post-independence and a lot of people um, are becoming nostalgic about their times in India, about their grandfathers and their forefathers living in India. There's a lot of interest in Anglo-Indian culture and also because um, India is a booming economy and people realize like why do uh, Indians speak English and why uh, is the education so good and they're doing all these uh, call centers and businesses with the West and one of the reasons is that it's our community who set the foundation with a good Anglo-Indian schools, a good education, um, people speak English uh, very well in India, everything is conducted in English so that's one of the reasons why the economy is booming. They've got this solid foundation. And they've got the really yes, solid, yeah. the Anglo-Indian schools yeah. in particular, it's, it's revolutionized Indian education. And as you said, language, because English mm. being the universal language and all that sort of thing. And so, yeah. yeah. So India's got a lot, lot to be proud of, and a lot of it is because of the Anglo-Indian community. So I'm a well, your book and books like yours, they could be said to be a literary monument to the Anglo-Indian community. Now, we at the Anglo-Indian Heritage Centre are thinking about building an actual monument to the Anglo-Indian community. Um, what do you think of that idea and can you give us your ideas on what you would like to see, how you would like the monument to be presented, what form and what you'd like to see on there? I'd love to for it to eventuate and I'd love for it to be like uh, the thing I have in my mind is a garden setting with a, a wall with going back in time from the time that the ships used to come to India and the troops and then uh, it was actually the East India Company at that stage yeah. and then uh, telling the history of the British in India and the mutiny and then the British Raj and uh, working towards independence and uh, capturing that whole history. Oh, I'd, I'd love it to be yeah. something like that, an outdoor monument. Yeah, so anybody that, walking yeah. past will see it. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully come into the centre. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's very I, interesting. I would love to visit it myself and I hope yeah. it happens in my lifetime. That's very yeah. interesting, yes. Selma, so, what uh, tips and advice can you offer people, like budding authors who want to embark on a project similar to yours? I think anyone can do it. If I could do it, anyone could do it. Just work on the concept and uh, uh, try and get help if you can with editing and uh, find someone to publish the book. Zelma, I believe that you still have copies of your first book available and that all people need to do to find out more about it, the price and whatever, is to email you. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. 
Thank you, Selma. We really appreciate you taking part in our Anglo-Indian Stories series.